Hey, what's up? I'm going to show you how to basically take a Python program or script that you've made and package it up behind an executable file. This should work on Windows, Mac, and Linux. I'm going to demonstrate it on Windows right now. So the program I'll, or the module, the third-party module I'll be using is called CX Freeze. And you can just run this pip install CX Freeze command right there to... Uh, Basically, that you'd run that as administrator, or else you'll you might have to add like dash dash user or whatever. Shouldn't be too difficult to figure out. Um, so this works for Python 3.6 and higher. If you happen to be trying, if you're like me and you like to compile some stuff for older systems, like XP. Um, basically, so Python 3.6 through 3.8 well I should say 3.8 and earlier will run on Vista in Windows 7 so if you're gonna do this and plan on distributing it to a lot of people and you wanna not obsolete old computers then you might wanna use like Python 3.7 or 3.8 or something instead of 3.10 because 3.10 you're gonna need Windows I believe Windows 8.1 or higher so anyway, that's just a side note. So what you can do too is you could go to release history. And if you scroll way down, there's 5.0.2 somewhere in here, right here, May 20th, 2017. So this version, if you come in here, where is it? And then if I, so now I'm on that version, here's how to install that. Pip install CX freeze equals equals 502. That specific one, if you're using Python 3.4 and trying to package something for XP, then if I go over here to download files with this version selected, then you can see there's all the files. And down here, it says uh, CP, which is CPython 3.4. So if you go searching around in any of the higher versions, you're, it's going to be like 3.5 or 3.6 and higher. So Py, uh, the last version of Python to run on XP was 3.4. So that's just a quick side note about that. Now I'm going to go back to the regular old CX freeze, the newest version at the time of this recording, which I've already installed by running pip install. So just wanted to get all that out of the way. Or of course you can download the wheel in the download section like I showed even for the newest ones. You can go here, download, and then uh, you know, make sure to get 64-bit if you're 64-bit, 32-bit if you're 32-bit. And I don't know if I mentioned it a second ago, but you not only would probably want to use, like, say, Python 3.8 to distribute your stuff, but you'd probably want to also use 32-bit. Um, of course, there's, pro there's a potential for some performance penalties for that, usually only in certain scenarios. Um, but the thing is, is that there were still a lot of 32-bit installs with Windows 7 and Windows Vista. And believe it or not, even Windows 10 was available in a 32-bit edition. So don't think that there's nobody out there running 32-bit. So the last note on that would be use Python 3.8 32-bit for the widest reaching modern sort of thing and I believe with Python 3.8 you still get the walrus operator so you still get probably most if not all of the features you'd be after all right closing out that tab moving along so here's the uh, cx dash freeze dot read the docs dot io and uh, you can see it's got a some of this details you scroll down here and it the contents for the docs using cx freeze you might have been here before what they do is they kind of focus a little bit more heavily on like this B dist MSI and stuff like that. So what that will do, of course, is give you an installer file. And just to try and keep this one short for now, I'm not going to do the installer files. So this will make it so that basically you can just zip up the results and unpack them in like somebody's user folder, double click on the EXE and you're off to the races kind of a thing. But if you do want to get after you get this far, with what we're doing right here if you want to go ahead and add an installer you just build on this knowledge of but we're going to make a standalone executable file on windows and so of course there's that upgrade command that you'd want to 
or no, the user command was the one I was thinking. But yeah, anyway, this is all just rehash. Python requirements. You shouldn't need a C compiler, I don't believe. I have a couple on my system, but I don't think it was utilizing them in any way, shape, or form. Um, I'm just going to scan through this stuff. Setup script. Okay, here's where we start getting to the thick of it. So in order to make use, the setup script must be created, typically called setup.py by convention. Sometimes if I have a bunch of them, I'll name it like setup dash program name or whatever, just to differentiate. It doesn't have to be setup.py, but if you're on the fence with the name, just pick that one. And so here's basically just about probably the most generic setup script you can get for Windows at least. And uh, what I did was I took that one and I went over here and I kind of, I modified it. So what I'm going to be showing you, I started with this script and I just started editing it. So what I did basically is I took this build exe options, which is just a little variable they made. You could call it anything. And if you look down here, they're just passing it in down here. So what they did was they just, they put it up here to kind of keep it separate because it has a tendency to get bulky. As you can see right here. Here's my build.exe options. And then I added a bunch of stuff that like, if you kind of dig through the help files a little bit more, you'd find all these options. I left most of them empty, but they're just there for illustrative purposes to see that, you know, there's all those kind of options you can look into. So the big one here is excludes um, and also include files and optimize. Those are the main ones we care about right now. And so under excludes, it's kind of like a uh, JSON, you know, that's just a Python dictionary. And of course this one is just a regular old scalar value. And then the rest of these are lists. Um, they can be empty, they can be one item or they can be multiple items. So exclude is the key, it's a string. And then right here we can see we begin a list just like in these other ones, but way longer. So I put everything on its own line in alphabetical order. And also that allows me to uh, append a comment to it and individually comment ones out. So don't think that if I comment it out, I'm not including it once I get down here and you can't see. So everything that's uncommented is being excluded and the things that are commented are being included. Okay, so all these ones that's, that I have the comment that says required for console they're for sure they're probably required for uh for the gui the graphic interface as well as the console but i was only able to 100 percent verify them with the time and knowledge that i have that they're definitely required for the console so it seems to be required for both but whatever don't take everything i say as 100 percent. but this should be like i don't know 98 percent accurate or something like that good enough all right, so you'll need, I basically just went through and just based on the output of running CX free, uh, freeze like a dozen times or more, I, I went through and found all the modules that it's trying to include because it actually tries to include too much, which you probably know you're getting like huge executable sizes, massive directories and all that kind of stuff. Um, I guess that was just like a fail safe over the years. They probably just decided, hey, let's just err towards like including too much instead of not enough or something's my guess. So anyway, what I do is I, I went through and basically just got a list of all the modules that it seemed to uh, talk about and I excluded them all. And then I went back one by one in the console mode and had it like, say hey this one's missing and then i go in here find it in the alphabetical list and comment it out so therefore it would allow it to be included and as you can see there's probably a half dozen or so that that had to be included and right here that's when let's see what they have over here uh yeah they have it as a win32 gui i just went ahead instead of doing this whole weird thing like that i just cut all that code out and i just stuck the base, I just stuck it in there, hard coded right there. I mean, maybe if you have a bigger script, it might matter. I guess that won't work if you want the script to be truly multi platform compatible. Uh, Win32 GUI, as far as I know, I guess that's, you know, that's obviously exclusive to Windows, so it's going to cause problems on Mac or Linux if you run the same script. All you got to do is just Pick whatever system you want to be able to comment that out or change it to a console or none. 
And so the main things to worry about here is you probably want to make sure the name of your programs somewhat accurate, maybe the description and version if you care about those kind of things. And then uh, this executable down here is pretty key. This is probably the only one you really have to worry about is that that pi file matches your script. And you can have multiple executables, stuff like that, but I'm just going to keep it uh, lowest common denominator simple kind of thing. All right. So we jump back over to this script and you can see from here, this is like this setup portion. And I have that all right here under those excludes, right? And I left most of it the same. I just changed mine. This, what I'm using as a demonstration is a frames per second counter for Pi game. So this demonstrates a graphical user interface app as well as a third party library, particularly a gaming library. So it has a lot of stuff like sound and uh, things like that potentially and then what we're calling right here is just build exe which I think they do they do that yeah they just do a build exe for theirs as well so that one should not you would call this with the build exe command line see so what they're doing right here is they're doing a build msi with it we're not going to do that we're going to do a build where's do they have it on here yeah, build exe, this is what we're going to do. But we're not going to include any of these command line options. So most everything that you see in here can be, I want to say, underridden by a command line. I can't remember off the top of my head which one takes precedence. I think the file takes precedence, but I could totally be wrong on that. Uh, dig into the docs or experiment for yourself to verify that if you need to. So yeah, we're going to do the build exe, which won't create a, an installer. We'll just create a quote-unquote standalone executable, but there will be uh, some data files behind that, of course. Um, this optimization level. So if I scroll back to the top of my file, that first option I'm passing in here is optimize. So zero is no optimization. One is bytecode optimization which if it aligns with some of the built-in stuff with Python's libraries, I believe that would probably just remove assert statements. I haven't tested it. And then if you pick a two, which I did, that's gonna also, that's the full optimization capabilities. That's gonna also remove doc strings. So I would probably recommend picking two unless you're using that convention where you put a doc string at the very top of the file and you are using that for like command line help like that type of a thing or anything else where your program might rely on the doc strings and obviously you want to leave that in but otherwise go ahead and optimize it level two and so this bin includes path those are i mean the documentation says it all i don't want to waste any time on that stuff the zip includes, we can't use those for a lot of like Pygame because it's not pure Python. It has uh, DLL files. It has native code like C, library, C code basically. Um, it has to be pure Python code as far as I know to use the zip includes, which would save a little bit of space, but probably not a huge deal. And there, of course, is the command line equivalence of all of that stuff. What else? That's the installer file. Just double checking if there's anything else worth mentioning in here. So CX freeze executable. You can go in and add all those details if you want to. I don't think there's much else in here worth talking about. I mean, maybe there is. Frequently asked questions is going to have some stuff. What it specifically is this using data files right here is uh, this and the Microsoft Visual C redistributable package. So applications often need data files besides the code, such as icons using a setup script. You can list data files or directories in the include files option to build exe. They'll be copied to the build directory alongside the executable to find them use code like this. So of course, build exe is talking about the finalized exe that you're gonna basically double click to run your program. It's not the installer file, right? So if we come over here and look include files and I just have a data directory. So here's my program 
And there's my data directory. All I have is the Pygame logo as a PNG file in there. And if I go back up one, I have my frames per second counter program, which I already have open right here. Kind of a little gnarly looking, not too big a deal. And then uh, and then setup.py, which I also have open, which is the one that we're using here. All right. So the the one main catch, if you are using, this doesn't matter if you're not using like a separate, like separate, if you just have a .py file, say, then this doesn't matter. But if you do have like icons or uh, PNGs or text files or any kind of files that you need to access within your program while it's running, this will apply to you. So what it's, what they've done here is they basically created a function called find data file and they pass it a file name and then they say, if, and then they, on the sys module, they get an attribute because it's an object, right? And they say, if that object has a frozen property on it, then that means the application's been frozen by CX freeze. It adds that little uh, property on there. But if not, if it doesn't, then it's going to go ahead and pass a false. It's a little confusing when you read it. It, does, it says, if get attribute sys frozen false, it almost sounds like if this is false, then do that. But it's not. False is a default value in case this doesn't exist. And so that's basically that really means the result would be true if it's frozen, not false. And so then it, it's the application's frozen. So we're going to set this data variable, data dir. Uh, using OS path, dir name, sys executable. So sys is the interpreter module, basically, and it goes and finds, hey, where's where's the executable, I believe? It's either, yeah, shouldn't be where it's executing from. It should be the file that actually, the exe file, if I'm correct, if I have it correct. And then it's going to assign that location to data directory, else the application's not frozen, and it's going to set the data directory to file, which this goes to the .py file location, wherever that happens to be, uh, you know, if it's not frozen, if it's not an executable file. And it's going to say, hey, this is actually where we're running from. So it's just one of those little catches that you have to do. And then, of course, they return that result. Um, they join it. So OS path join is like a platform independent way of taking, you know, say this on Windows, it might be like C colon backslash source backslash my video game or whatever. And then the file name that they passed in here, it's going to join it. So it will join it by basically if you're on like Linux or Mac, it's going to put a forward slash there. And if you're on Windows, it will put a backslash. So that's that's what's going on there. And just to show you where I've added that to my code in here is, of course, I've imported the uh, OS path module and sys. And then down here, just a little ways, I have this whole chunk of code. And that's effectively doing the same thing. So I did data dir all caps to kind of represent like a constant. And uh, I'm using, there is the path library. You might be wondering, why are you using the, uh, the path lib? path class and creating an, a, a path object with that and as an object oriented purist I would definitely recommend normally doing that in a program but uh, with this one situation it's there's a lot less dependencies because if I come in here and I have these ones required for console com I'll put this code on a like a github gist or something and put a link to it under the under the video on YouTube but any of this stuff I have that says required for console comment in there, just picture that as just being required, period. And uh, then there's these other ones, required package, which isn't just a standalone module. It's a package of multiple modules. So those are, any of the packages are required as far as the core ones. Um, so right here I have some that are, they have a comment after them required for pathlib, but I have those uncommented over here on the left. So they're, they are being excluded because I did try and do path, uh, pathlib instead. It's since Python 3.4, it's, uh, as far as your own code internally looks, it's, it's a lot prettier and nicer and flows a lot better in my opinion, but it just brought in all these dependencies. I don't think they're totally huge. I didn't really check the file size difference. I don't, but I don't believe they're like, you know, adding megabytes necessarily. Maybe a meg or two. I don't know. You have to check it out and see. 
But uh, yeah, I it's just so there's a path lib requirement. Here's a path lib requirement. Here's a path lib requirement. Here's one. Here's two. Here's one. So if you're already using pathlib in your program, then you might as well just go ahead and do it. But if you're just doing a one-off little simple script, then uh, then the good old-fashioned os.path module doesn't require anything other than, uh, I believe, of course, I should have to have an os in here, or do I? Which reminds me, I'll show. So OS is being excluded. However, this program, you know, it's not the most robust thing in the world, the CX freeze. So somehow it's including OS uh, right here. You can see I have OS path excluded, but it's overriding that somewhere and including it. So I leave it excluded because obviously it doesn't break when it needs it. It will just bring it in anyway. But um, this will also allow it to be excluded when it doesn't need it, most likely. So that's kind of what's going on there. Okay. And then this Microsoft Visual C++ redistributable package, if you're using Python 3.6, probably, you know, through 3.10, 3.11 is about to come out, I think, this fall, time of this recording, that will probably use a similar redistributable. Um, I believe the Python 3.4 would use the 2010 redistributable. If you did go back that route, they give you links right here to them. And if you you only need whatever Python you use to do this process that we're talking right here, whether it's 32 bit or 64 bit, that's the only redistributable you need. So like I recommended, if you use like Python 3.8, 32 bit, all you need to uh, pass along is this uh, for x86 32 bit Windows, right? And that's only for the Windows one. But of course, if you do 64-bit, that one's close to twice as big, um, then you might want to package that one. Most people probably by now, if they're running a relatively modern version of Windows, basically Vista or 7 or higher, then they probably already have a good enough redistributable on their system. So, you know, you don't, you might not have to, because it's going to add like 15 to 25 megabytes, I want to say, to the size of your package but if you're unsure i would you know like i said python 3.8 32-bit with this redistributable and if you actually send this one in right here that i've got on the screen then you should be legit like you should be allowed to go ahead and um pass that one along but if you have uh you might notice that cx freeze has an option for automatically packing in the dlls that one I believe if you have like the Visual Studio tools or whatever installed, then you should be legit maybe. Don't quote me on that. But whatever. Of course, with Microsoft, there's potentially license things. All right. So let's get that out of there. Is there anything else to note out of here? So yeah, just make sure all this required for console stuff is commented out. And then what we can do is we can actually run this uh set up pi thing from right here of course like i said i have this right next to my frames per second counter program i have that set up pi we're looking at right next to it so they're in the same folder and then i just have that data files and what i can do is if i want to i can just hit shift f5 in uh idle and that's going to do uh customize run and i'm passing the build exe argument and i'm restarting the shell i'm going to hit okay sometimes it'll ask me if i want to save there I recommend probably just building from a regular console window because uh, it's it's a lot faster because this idle is most or all written in Python. So it's a little slower to kind of spit all the output out. So it takes maybe up to a minute or something. And it's just going through and scanning all the stuff and doing its thing right now and in probably 20 or 30 seconds we should have it should be all done so you might see those i don't know if it's too blurry on your end with the low frame rate and all that but there's some lines that started with a question mark if you do have any trouble 
with your program go back all that's one of the main reasons i wanted to run in here this is a little friendlier i feel like for coming back see it says package util imported from pkg resources um is that what it, i don't know it's been a while since i really dug into this but this is these question marks are kind of helping you out letting you know what was going on let me see if i scroll way back up here if it gives us a more informative message so it's all the OpenGL stuff that Pygame brings in. If you have uh, the OpenGL packages for Python installed, then it will just automatically bring them over as well. Scrolling down here. Okay, now we're getting to these things with the M's preceding them. Those are all modules. I believe the ones with the underscore are the native ones, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going to scroll down here. You can see ABC, which should be abstract base classes, uh, I believe all these so it's pulling these in like or at least trying to right there's an m my screen resolution is kind of zoomed in but otherwise they usually only take up one line each one of these would be on one line encodings blah 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 so this is just all stuff to dig through if you have any trouble you want to make sure that you're including like okay it's using nt path if whatever it'll probably complain on the command line actually if or in a pop-up box if something's missing and we'll say hey I can't find you know string or whatever on line 29 so then you go back to that setup file and you come down here and find like oh there's string okay I, I need to comment that out so it's no longer excluded for instance all right so now if I jump back over here now you can see there's a build directory created from that setup script so I'm going to double click into this build directory and right here it's telling you you've got an executable for Windows on the 64-bit platform with Python 3.10. So this won't run on Windows Vista or Windows 7 for sure. Um, so that's just something to note. I just happen to have Python 3.10 loaded. That's why I'm showing that. I double-click on that, and there's my program, Frames Per Second Counter, which is just like this frames fps-counter.py, but now it's fps counter.exe so let's see how much space all this takes up i'm going to highlight them all and hit properties so it's taken up 24.4 about 25 megabytes not bad start right we can do even better though so we double click in here we can see it brought over that data directory like we asked it to and then if we go into lib here now this is where we can dig in so we can go into this if we double click this library.zip we can see here that uh Here's our program. And they're they're bytecode files now. That's why they're PyC files. So it it's basically kind of it abstracts your code away. They should be binary files. So if I were to like uh view one of them, then it says it's a binary file. So it doesn't even want to look at it. Just so you know, it kind of obfuscates your code, so to speak. Okay, so let's dig into this Pi game and see if there's anything else, any fat we can trim. And sure enough, there is because there's the docs. Which, you know, you don't need to, why do they need these? It's not even going to help them out if they run into trouble. The examples, it's got all of this junk that's from the example games and stuff that's not even your game. It, or I don't know, maybe it is. If it is, of course, you want to leave it in there if you utilized any of that. But uh, And, of course, tests, which I don't think this takes up a whole lot of space, but uh, probably unnecessary. So we're going to get rid of docs, examples, and tests. And I'm going to hit delete on those. So that kind of trimmed that up. And then we go up here. Well, if you do have these OpenGL libraries installed in Python and you're not specifically using OpenGL in your Pi game, then you can just delete those as well. Free up a little bit more space. All right, let's go back out here and see how much space is this now taking up. Whoa, I almost deleted it. Hey, where's properties at? Oh, is it off the bottom of the screen? Okay, let me see if I go. Huh, that's funny. Uh, what did I do last time? This. There we go. I got it. I'm recording in a lower resolution, obviously. Okay, so it's down to 15.7, about 16 megabytes from 24. So we we got rid of about eight megabytes there. Is that right? Yeah. I can't do math right now for some reason. So we've got to trim down to about 16 megabytes. Let's see if our program runs, which I probably should have done in the first place, but I've done it in the past. Okay, so I'm going to double click the EXE. 
and there it is running at about 60 frames a second all right so if we jump back over here uh so what i have here is i have a line to print to the console so that we can see if the console output's going on so right here if you look this is in a c drive source python 3 cx free app da 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 da, da. And so we're in that app directory. And what I can do is I can type build. And then I can hit the tab completion to get that. And then put a backslash and hit tab completion a couple times to get the program. Now what I'm doing is I'm not only running the program at the console, but I'm also executing it from outside of that directory. So if we go in and navigate to it and double click, then the interpreter, if your thing's set up, like mine is, it's going to, well, at least with the EXE, it should always be like that. It's going to um, run the program from the directory you're probably expecting it to. Right here, what's happening is we're running it from a couple directories down. So our data files aren't necessarily relative to what we might think they are. So this is kind of a good test to perform. Yeah, I do that. I'm not getting any console output, but everything's working. So that's good. And so since our program, in case you do care about, like if you're logging to the console or whatever for debugging or just to say, hey, or whatever purpose, you might want that console there. So basically that's one of the big deals with the Win32 GUI thing is it's not going to give you, it's going to ignore the console. It's not going to try and pop one up or do any of that stuff that looks kind of ghetto or whatever. Uh, so I'm going to show you how to activate that. So if we come down here to that base, and we change that to console, save it, and then I'm gonna go ahead and run this from the command line instead. So I can run Python, if you're on Linux and translating this to that, like Debian based distros, you probably do Python 3. And then I'm gonna run a setup, and then I can't forget to put that build exe on there. And I'm going to hit enter. And this is going to run a lot faster than it did inside of the idle environment once it kicks in. But it's also running a little slower too because I'm recording a video right now. And if we look over here, what it does is it actually booted us out of this directory if we were in there. And it delete it automatically deletes this folder um, and re redoes it from scratch so you don't have to worry about that part see it's already it's been done back there okay so now i can run that program again and this time you can see we got the hello from pi game i'm going to go ahead and shut this down it's working it's good all right so we have the the hello from pi game kind of thing that it usually does you might be familiar with and there's that hello console that we were expecting so that's a way to get console output if however if I run this from in here, go back into that and double click it like this, now it's gonna pop up that console window in the background, which some people think is annoying, but of course for debugging purposes, whatever, um, it can be pretty handy. You know, you can have it spit out little pieces of information about what's going on. And then if I close this console, since it hasn't returned the prompt, that means you know the, the Python program basically owns it. So if I click X, it shuts down the entire Pygame window that we had open because it, it's, uh, it depends on that window. So once again, I can just come down here and just change this back to Win32GUI, hit Shift F5, or actually I, I don't want to hit Shift F5, I'm just going to hit Control S, jump back over here, and then I'm going to run that setup. I'm going to do Python setup. And in almost no time, oh, forgot to build.exe, okay, or build underscore exe. And of course, it's going to pit back all the OpenGL and the Py, uh, Pygame docs and all that kind of stuff. So just be sure and jump back in there and cut all that fat out of there if uh, if you don't want that which I'll do one last time to cap it off here. And if I missed anything or you have any questions about maybe try to look something up in more detail, 
and it didn't work out quite so well for you, go ahead and leave that in the comments and I'll try and get around to it. All right, back to GUI so there's no console output even though we are printing statements within the program there. And we'll go ahead and close that off, jump back over here, and double check it's still working if I double click it, and of course it is. So I'll zoom, go back into lib, Pi game in my particular instance, whatever libraries you're using, remember you'll want to uh, make sure not to exclude them in there. You might even have to manually include them if uh, if CX Freeze can't figure it out. So I deleted those three directories. I'm going to delete OpenGL since I'm in this particular case, I'm not using them. And then I'll go back up here. I'll select all this stuff, right click prop, oh, right click properties and 15.7 megabytes and I'll double click it just to double check that I didn't accidentally remove anything that shouldn't be removed. It's still working. Here's the setup script. So I'll put both the setup script and that example program in a gist and put links to both of those. Um, so let's say that if for some reason if Pygame wasn't being detected since that is a package which has multiple modules within it, I just put it right here like this, Pygame. And that should include it manually. That's another option to do. But in this particular case, CX Freeze was able to deduce that it needed it. And for now, that about wraps it up. Thanks a lot for watching.